Next, let's have a look at the container in more detail. A container is a control which can contain other controls. Functions to add controls to and remove controls from a container are also provided. A container will automatically delete its child controls when it's being destroyed. The representative container classes are the form, panel, and window subclasses. The form class is used as a component to construct a UI screen. A form class has a title and provides functionality to change the UI according to the orientation of the mobile phone. The panel class basically groups multiple controls, allows a specific background to be set for the entire group, and has special child classes such as overlay panel and scroll panel. In general, the subclasses of the window class are used when a function is performed by the combination of multiple controls. So, let's have a look at the functionality of the form that is used to change the orientation of the UI when the orientation of the mobile phone is also changed. First, to make the form react to a change in the orientation of the terminal, you have to set the form as a subclass of the I orientation event listener. Then, you need to register this object in the construct function of the form by using the orientation event listener of the form. After registering this to the listener, if the orientation of the phone is changed, the on orientation changed function of the listener object is called. At this time, the current orientation of the phone is provided as an input parameter. Also, the orientation of the UI can be changed by changing the location and size of the subcontrol according to the orientation of the phone. Next, I'll explain the overlay panel, which is a subclass of the panel. This class has been developed to provide special functionality for playing videos or showing a camera preview. This class consists of two components, the background buffer and the foreground panel. The video or camera preview is drawn in the background buffer. Other controls, such as a button or slide, are overlaid over the video or camera preview in the foreground panel. In addition, the following window-based controls are provided. Menu controls, such as context menu and option menu, as well as input controls, like date picker, timekeeper, and keypad. Also, there are frame, message box, and pop-up controls. All these controls contain predefined controls within them, and they all cooperate with each other except for the frame. Then, let's have a look at the option menu in more detail. The option menu refers to the horizontally arranged buttons that rise from the bottom of the form when the option menu key at the bottom of the form is pressed. At this time, since the option menu key is the default control of the form, the developer only needs to develop the option menu. Now I'll explain the procedures to actually create the option menu. First, I've declared the show hide option menu function in the form class for convenience. Then I've declared an option menu pointer as a member variable. In the construct function of the form, I have added a form underscore style underscore option key flag so that the option key is displayed at the bottom of the form. In the form's on initializing function, I've created a new option menu and added two items to the option menu. The first, the first parameter is the string that appears in the option menu. The second parameter is the item's action ID. Then, I've assigned an action ID to the option key that the form inherently has, and I've allocated a listener for the option key. In the show hide option menu function, I change the state of the option menu by calling the option menu's show state method with the show input parameter. If the option menu is to be shown on the screen, it's displayed by calling the option menu's show function. If the option menu is to be hidden, the form is redrawn by calling the form's show function. 
In the on action performed event listening function, if the ID is an option key, the show hide option menu function is called with the show parameter set to true. In the on action performed function, we can perform the appropriate operations for when the option menu buttons are pressed. It's not necessary to add a function to hide the option menu because BADA supports a function which hides the option menu by default if a point outside the option menu is touched. Next, I'll explain the concept of a tab. A tab is generally used to switch pages when the screen has more than one page, as you can see in this figure. Unlike the option menu item, a tab is a control of a form. Therefore, to use the tab function, you can create a tab by enabling the tab of the form and specifying the properties of each tab button. Next, let's have a look at the actual source code. First, in the construct function of the form, I've enabled a text tab by adding the form underscore style underscore text underscore tab flag to the form style. In the on initializing function, I acquired the forms tab by calling the get tab function and then added items to the tab. Here, the first parameter is the string to appear in the tab and the second parameter is the tab's action ID. To detect whether a tab has been pressed, the object has been added as an action event listener. The next function is the on action performed listener function. In this function, you can perform a specific task according to the action ID received. Generally, when using tabs, the screen switching effect is provided by showing or hiding some of the controls. Now, let's see an application that uses more than one form. As I mentioned before, a form can be regarded as a page that constructs a single screen at a time. Therefore, in many cases, an application needs more than one form. When an application contains many forms, a process to switch between forms is required. I'll explain how to switch between forms using a very simple example. As you can see here, I've declared two form classes. The application class has two form pointers. To switch forms more easily, I've declared the moveToForm function. This is the on-app initializing function of the application. While the source code created by the template creates one form, in this function, I've created two forms. After that, I've added each of the forms to the frame and set the current form as one of the two forms. This moveToForm function changes the current form displayed based on the form number input parameter. Here, I checked the index range for safety, and if the index is within the range, the frame is acquired from the application. The required form is then assigned as the frame's current form. Then, the request redraw function of the frame is called to reflect this change. In this example, assume that a button has been attached to the form to enable the switching of forms. Then, if the button is pressed, the onActionEventListener function is called. At this time, you can acquire an instance of the application by calling the getInstance function and switch forms by calling the moveToForm function, specifying the next form. However, if you use this method, there can be a memory management problem. So, if you have to use multiple forms, it's recommended that you create a form manager. For more information about creating a form manager, refer to the basic app of the BADA application sample. Lastly, I'll explain the UI Builder. The UI Builder is a tool to design a form in the XML code format. You can create a form, add controls to the form, and set the properties of the controls by using the UI Builder. Until now, I've explained how to create a UI by writing source code. Developing a user interface in the XML format using the UI Builder offers the following advantages. First, localization becomes easier. 
If you create localized XML files for each locale, the files are automatically loaded according to the locale, and you don't need to modify the source code for the UI depending on the locale. Another important advantage is you don't need to support various types of devices. So, if you create XML files for each device that has a different resolution, the appropriate XML file is loaded for the device. Finally, you can design more beautiful and sophisticated UIs through the what you see is what you get interface. The following common properties can be set when you use the UI builder. The first one is the object ID. This ID is an important property for accessing the control from within the source code. You can define the size and position of the control on a form, as well as the text, text alignment, and text color. In addition, you can define the parent-child relationship. When the XML format UI file is loaded, memory is allocated to each of the controls in the XML file, and the hierarchy of the controls is set. In addition, the properties specified in the XML file are set to the corresponding controls. To use these controls in the source code, you can get the pointer to the control using its ID, and if necessary, you can set additional properties. For example, you can set the event listener or action ID and set the items for a list in the source code. Now, let's see how you can load and use an XML UI file. As you can see, to load and connect an XML file to a form, the UI name must be specified in the construct function of the form. To acquire the handle of a control from the loaded form, you can do that by calling the getControl function with the ID specified in the UI builder. Now, it's time to wrap up this lecture. In the first part of the lecture, I described six principles to create a good UI. Then, I introduced various controls and functions. Among these, I explained the roles of various containers in detail. The container that performs the most important role among containers is a form. I explained how to switch between forms when an application uses more than one form. Finally, I explained the features and advantages of the UI Builder and how to use the UI created by using the UI Builder in a program.